Hello everybody, my name is Mrs McKenna uh, and I work at St Cuthbert's as a higher level teaching assistant um, in the languages department and I'm going to read to you chapter five. The next morning Tommy, Alan and me waited outside the gates for Steve but there was no sign of him by the time the bell rang for class so we had to go in. I bet he's dossing, Tommy said. He couldn't get the tickets and now he doesn't want to face us. Steve's not like that, I said. I hope he brings the flyer back, Alan said. Even if we can't go, I'd like to have the flyer. I'd stick it up over my bed and... You couldn't stick it up, stupid, Tommy laughed. Why not, Alan asked. Because Tony would see it, I told him. Oh yeah, Alan said glumly. I was miserable in class. We had geography first and every time Mrs Quinn asked me a question, I got it wrong. Normally, geography is my best subject because I know so much about it from when I used to collect stamps. Had a late night, Darren, she asked when I got my fifth question wrong. No, Mrs Quinn, I lied. I think you did, she smiled. There are more bags under your eyes than in the local supermarket. Everybody laughed at that. Mrs Quinn didn't quack jokes very often, and I did too, even though I was the butt of the joke. The morning dragged, the way it does when you feel let down or disappointed. I spent the time imagining the freak show. I made believe I was one of the freaks and the owner of the circus was a nasty guy who whipped everybody, even when they got stuff right. All the freaks hated him, but he was so big and mean, nobody said anything. Until one day, he whipped me once too often and I turned into a wolf and bit his head off. Everybody cheered and I was made the new owner. It was a pretty good daydream. Then, a few minutes before break, the door opened and guess who walked in? Steve! His mother was behind him and she said something to Mrs Quinn, who nodded and smiled. Then Mrs Leonard left and Steve strolled over to his seat and sat down. Where were you? I asked in a furious whisper. At the dentist, he said. I forgot to tell you I was going. What about? That's enough, Darren, Mrs Quinn said. I shut up instantly. At break, Tommy, Alan and me almost smothered Steve. We were shouting and pulling at him at the same time. Did you get the tickets? I asked. Were you really at the dentist? Tommy wanted to know. Where's my flyer? Alan asked. Patience, boys, patience, Steve said, pushing us away and laughing. All good things to those who wait. Come on, Steve, don't mess us around, I told him. Did you get them or not? Yes and no, he said. What does that mean? Tommy snorted. It means I have some good news, some bad news and some crazy news, he said. Which do you want to hear first? Crazy news? I asked, puzzled. Steve pulled us off to one side of the yard, checked to make sure no one was about, then began speaking in a whisper. I got the money, he said, and sneaked out at seven o'clock when Mum was on the phone. I hurried across town to the ticket booth, but do you know who was there when I arrived? Who? we asked. Mr Dalton, he said. He was there with a couple of policemen. They were dragging a small guy out of the booth. It was only a small shed, really. When suddenly was this huge bang and great cloud of smoke covered them all. When it cleared, the small guy had disappeared. What did Mr Dalton and the police do? Alan asked. Examined the shed, looked around a bit and then left. They didn't see you, Tommy asked. No, Steve said. I was well hidden. So you didn't get the tickets? I, I didn't say that, he contradicted me. You got them, I gasped. I turned to leave, he said, and found the small guy behind me. He was tiny and dressed in a long cloak which covered him from head to toe. He spotted the flyer in my hand, took it and held out the tickets. I handed over the money and... You got them, we roared delightedly. Yes, he beamed. And then his face fell. But there was a catch. I told you there was bad news, remember? What is it? I asked, thinking he'd lost them. He only stole me two, Steve said. I had the money for four, but he wouldn't take it. He didn't say anything, just tapped the bit on the flyer about certain reservations then handed me a card which said that the Cirque de Freak only sold two tickets per flyer. I offered him extra money. I had nearly £70 in total, 
but he wouldn't accept it. He only sold you two tickets, Tommy asked dismayed. But that means, Alan began. Only two of us can go, Steve finished. He looked around at us grimly. Two of us will have to stay at home. Hi, I'm Mrs Ebison and I work in the English department. I'm going to read chapter six. It was Friday evening, the end of the school week, the start of the weekend, and everybody was laughing and running home as quick as they could, delighted to be free. Except a certain miserable foursome who hung around the schoolyard looking like the end of the world had arrived. Their names? Steve Leonard, Tommy Jones, Alan Morris and me, Darren Shan. It's not fair, Alan moaned. Whoever heard of a circus only letting you buy two tickets? It's stupid. We all agreed with him, but there was nothing we could do about it, apart from stand around, stubbing the ground with our feet, looking sour. Finally, Alan asked the question which was on everybody's mind. So, who gets the tickets? We all looked at each other and shook our heads uncertainly. Well, Steve has to get one, I said. He put in more money than the rest of us, and he went to buy them. So he has to get one. Agreed? Agreed, Tommy said. Agreed, Alan said. I think he would have argued about it, except he knew he wouldn't win. Steve smiled and took one of the tickets. Who goes with me? He asked. I brought in the flyer, Alan said quickly. Nuts to that, I told him. Steve should get to choose. Not on your life, Tommy laughed. You're his best friend. If we let him pick, he'll pick you. I say we fight for it. I have boxing gloves at home. No way, Alan squeaked. He's small and never gets into fights. I don't want to fight either, I said. I'm no coward, but I knew I wouldn't stand a chance against Tommy. His dad teaches him how to box properly and they have their own punching bag. He would have floored me in the first round. Let's pick straws for it, I said, but Tommy didn't want to. He has terrible luck and never wins anything like that. We argued about it a bit more, until Steve came up with an idea. I know what to do, he said, opening his school bag. He tore the two middle sheets of paper out of an exercise book and, using his ruler, carefully cut them into small pieces, each one roughly the same size as the ticket. Then he got his empty lunchbox and dumped the paper inside. Here's how it works, he said, holding up the second ticket. I put this in, put the top on and shake it about, Okay. We nodded. You stand side by side and I'll throw the bits of paper over your heads. Whoever gets the ticket wins. Me and the winner will give the other two their money back when we can afford it. Is that fair enough or does somebody have a better idea? Sounds good to me, I said. I don't know, Alan grumbled. I'm the youngest. I'm not able to jump as high as... Quit yapping, Tommy said. I'm the smallest and I don't mind. Besides... The ticket might come out on the bottom of the pile, float down low, and mean just the right place for the shortest person. All right, Alan said, but no shoving. Agreed, I said. No rough stuff. Agreed. Tommy nodded. Steve put the top on the box and gave it a good long shake. Get ready, he told us. We stood back from Steve and lined up in a row. Tommy and Alan were side by side, but I kept out of the way, so I'd have room to swing both arms. OK, Steve said. I'll throw everything in the air on the count of three. All set? We nodded. One, Steve said, and I saw Alan wiping sweat from around his eyes. Two, Steve said, and Tommy's fingers twitched. Three, Steve yelled, jerked off the lid and tossed the paper high up into the air. A breeze came along and blew the bits of paper straight at us. Tommy and Alan started yelling and grabbing wildly. It was impossible to see the ticket in among the scraps of paper. I was about to start grabbing when all of a sudden I got an urge to do something strange. It sounded crazy, but I've always believed in following an urge or a hunch. So what I did was, I I shut my eyes, stuck out my hands like a blind man and waited for something magical to happen. As I'm sure you know, usually when you try something you've seen in a movie, it doesn't work. Like if you try doing a wheelie with your bike or making your skateboard jump up in the air. But every once in a while, when you least expect it, something clicks. For a second, I felt paper blowing by my hands. 
I was going to grab at them, but something told me it wasn't time. Then, a second later, a voice inside me yelled, Now! I shut my hands really fast. The wind died down and the pieces of paper drifted to the ground. I opened my eyes and saw Alan and Tommy down on their knees searching for the ticket. It's not here, Tommy said. I can't find it anywhere, Alan shouted. They stopped searching and looked up at me. I hadn't moved. I was standing still, my hands shut tight. What's in your hands, Darren? Steve asked softly. I stared at him, unable to answer. It was like I was in a dream where I couldn't move or speak. He doesn't have it, Tommy said. He can't have. He had his eyes shut. Maybe so, Steve said. But there's something in those fists of his. Open them, Alan said, giving me a shove. Let's see what you're hiding. I looked at Alan, then Tommy, then Steve. And then, very slowly, I opened my right hand fist. There was nothing there. My heart and stomach dropped. Alan smiled and Tommy started looking down at the ground again, trying to find the missing ticket. What about the other hand? Steve asked. I gazed down at my left hand fist. I'd almost forgotten about that one. Slowly, even slower than first time, I opened it. There was a piece of green paper smack dab in the middle of my hand, but it was lying face down. And since there was nothing on its back, I had to turn it over just to be sure. And there it was, in red and blue letters, the magical name, Cirque du Freak. I had it. The ticket was mine. I was going to the freak show with Steve. Yes, I screamed and punched the air with my fist. I'd won. Hello, I'm Mrs Elledge. Uh, I work for the Pushing Potential team and specifically I run the Rising Stars groups. I also teach health and social care and I'm going to read chapter seven for you. The tickets were for the Saturday show, which was just as well, since it gave me the chance to talk to my parents and ask if I could stay over at Steve's Saturday night. I didn't tell them about the freak show because I knew they would say no if they knew about it. I felt bad about not telling the whole truth, but at the same time, I hadn't really told a lie. All I'd done is keep my mouth shut. Saturday couldn't go quickly enough for me. I tried keeping busy because that's how you make time pass without noticing. But I kept thinking about the Cirque de Freak and wishing it was time to go. I was quite grumpy, which was odd for me on a Saturday. And mum was glad to see the back of me when it was time to go to Steve's. Annie knew I was going to the freak show and asked me to bring her back something, a photo if possible. But I told her cameras weren't allowed. It said so on the ticket. And I didn't have enough money for a t-shirt but she'd have to keep it hidden and not tell mum and dad where she'd got it from if they found it. Dad dropped me off at Steve's at six o'clock. He asked what time I wanted to be collected in the morning. I told him midday if that was okay. Don't watch horror movies, okay, he said before he left. I don't want you coming home with nightmares. Oh, dad, I groaned. Everyone in my class watches horror movies. Listen, he said. I don't mind an old Vincent Price film or one of the less scary Dracula movies, but none of these nasty new ones. Okay. Okay, I promised. Good man, he said, and drove off. I hurried up to the house and rang the bell four times, which was my secret signal to Steve. He must have been standing right inside because he opened the door straight away and dragged me in. About time, he growled, then pointed to the stairs. See that hill? He asked, speaking like a soldier in a war film. Yes, sir, I said, snapping my heels together. We have to take it by dawn. Are we using rifles or machine guns, sir? I asked. Are you mad? He barked. We'd never be able to carry a machine gun through all that mud. He nodded at the carpet. Rifles it is, sir, I agreed. And if we're taken, he warned me, save the last bullet for yourself. We started up the stairs like a couple of soldiers, firing imaginary guns at imaginary foes. It was childish, but great fun. Steve lost a leg along the way, and I had to help him to the top. You may have made taken my leg, he shouted from the landing, and you may take my life, but you'll never take my country. It was a stirring speech. 
At least it stirred Mrs. Leonard, who came through from the downstairs living room to see what the racket was. She smiled when she saw me and asked if I wanted anything to eat or drink. I didn't. Steve said he'd like some caviar and champagne, but it wasn't funny the way he said it, and I didn't laugh. Steve doesn't get on with his mum. He lives alone with her. His dad left when Steve was very young, and they're always arguing and shouting. I don't know why. I've never asked him. There are certain things you don't discuss with your friends if you're boys. Girls can talk about stuff like that, but if you're a boy, you have to talk about computers, football, war, and so on. Parents aren't cool. How will we sneak out tonight? I asked in a whisper as Steve's mum went back into the living room. It's okay, Steve said. She's going out. He often called her she instead of mum. She'll think we're in bed when she gets back. What if she checks? Steve laughed nastily. <laughs> Enter my room without being asked. She wouldn't dare. I didn't like Steve when he talked like that, but I said nothing in case he went into one of his moves. I didn't want to do anything that might spoil the show. Steve dragged out some of his horror comics and we read them aloud. Steve has great comics, which are only meant for adults. My mum and dad would hit the roof if they knew about them. Steve also has lots of old magazines and books about monsters and vampires and werewolves and ghosts. Does a stake have to be made out of wood? I asked when I'd finished reading the Dracula comic. No, he said. It can be metal or ivory, even plastic, as long as it's hard enough to go right through the heart. And will that kill a vampire? I asked. Every time, he said. I frowned. But you told me you have to cut off their heads and stuff them with garlic and toss them in a river. Some books say you have to, he agreed. But that's to make sure you kill the vampire's spirit as well as its body, so it can't come back as a ghost. Can a vampire come back as a ghost? I asked, eyes wide. Probably not, Steve said. But if he had the time and wanted to make sure, cutting off its head and getting rid of it would be worth doing. You don't want to take any chances with vampires, do you? Ooh, no, I said, shivering. What about werewolves? Do you need to see the bullets to kill them? I don't think so, Steve said. I think normal bullets can do the job. You might have to use lots of them, but they should work. Steve knows everything there is to know about horror facts. He's read every sort of horror book there is. He says every story has at least some bit of truth in it, even if most are made up. Do you think the wolfman at Cirque de Freak is a werewolf, I asked. Steve shook his head. From what I've read, he said, the wolfmen in freak shows are normally just very hairy guys. Some of them are more like animals than people and eat live chickens and stuff, but they're not werewolves. A werewolf would be no good in a show because it can only turn into a wolf when there's a full moon. Every other night, it would just be another guy. Oh, I said, what about the snake boy? Do you... Hey, save the questions for later. The shows long ago were terrible. The owners used to starve the freaks and keep them locked up in cages and treat them like dirt. But I don't know what this one will be like. They might not even be real freaks. They might only be people in costumes. The freak show was being held at a place near the other side of town. We had to leave not long after nine o'clock to make sure we got there in time. We could have got a cab, except we'd used most of our pocket money to replace the cash Steve took from his mum. Besides, it was more fun walking. It was spookier. We told ghost stories as we walked. Steve did most of the talking because he knows way more than me. He was on top form. Sometimes he forgets the end of stories or gets names mixed up, but not tonight. It was better than being with Stephen King. It was a long walk, longer than we thought, and we almost didn't make it on time. We had to run the last half a kilometre. We were panting like dogs when we got there. The venue was an old theatre which used to show movies. I passed it once or twice in the past. Steve told me once that it was shut down because a boy fell off a balcony and got killed. He said it was haunted. I asked my dad about it, and he said it was a load of lies. It's hard sometimes to know whether you should believe the story your dad tells you or the ones your best friends tell you. There was no name outside the door and no cars parked nearby and no queue. We stopped out front and bent over till we got our breath back. 
Then we stood and looked at the building. It was tall and dark and covered in jagged grey stones. Lots of the windows were broken and the door looked like a giant's open mouth. Are you sure this is the place? I asked, trying not to sound scared. This is what it says on the ticket, Steve said and checked again just to be sure. Yep, this is it. Maybe the police found out and the freaks had to move on, I said. Maybe there isn't any show tonight. Maybe, Steve said. I looked at him and licked my lips nervously. What do you think I should do? I asked. He stared back at me and hesitated before replying. I think we should go in, he finally said. We've come this far. It'd be silly to turn back now without knowing for sure. I agree, I said, nodding. Then I gazed up at the scary building and gulped. It looked like the sort of place you saw in a horror movie where lots of people go in but don't come out. Are you scared? I asked Steve. No, he said, but I could hear his cheese chattering and knew he was lying. Are you? he asked. Of course not, I said. We looked at each other and grinned. We knew we were both terrified, but at least we were together. It's not so bad being scared if you're not alone. Shall we enter? Steve asked, trying to sound cheerful. Might as well, I said. We took a deep breath, crossed our fingers, then started up the steps. There were nine stone steps leading up to the door, each one cracked and covered with moss, and we went in. Hi, I'm Mrs. Colnott. I'm the assistant Senko in school and I'm going to be reading chapter eight. We found ourselves standing in a long, dark, cold corridor. I had my jacket on, but shivered all the same. It was freezing. Why is it so cold? I asked Steve. It was warm outside. Old houses are like that, he told me. We started to walk. There was a light down by the other end. So the further we got in, the brighter it became. I was glad of that. I don't think I could have made it otherwise. It would have been too scary. The walls were scratched and scribbled on and bits of the ceiling were flaky. It was a creepy place. It would have been bad enough in the middle of the day, but this was 10 o'clock, only two hours away from midnight. There's a door here, Steve said, and stopped. He pushed it ajar and it creaked loudly. I almost turned and ran. It sounded like the lid of a coffin being tucked open. Steve showed no fear and stuck his head in. He said nothing for a few seconds while his eyes got used to the dark, then pulled back. It's the stairs up to the balcony, he said. Where the kid fell from, I asked. Yes. Do you think we should go up, I asked. He shook his head. I don't think so. It's dark up there. No sign of any sort of light. We'll try it if we can't find another way. But I think, can I help you boys? Somebody said behind us, and we nearly jumped out of our skins. We turned around quickly, and the tallest man in the world was standing there, glaring down on us as if we were a couple of rats. He was so tall, his head almost touched the ceiling. He had huge bony hands, and his eyes were so dark, they looked like two black coals stuck in the middle of his face. Isn't it rather late for two little boys like yourselves to be out and about? He asked. His voice was as dark and deep and croaky as a frog's, but his lips hardly seemed to move. He would have made a great ventriloquist. We, Steve began, but he had to stop and lick his lips before he could continue. We're here to see Cirque de Freak, he said. Are you? The man nodded slowly. Do you have tickets? Yes, Steve said, and showed his. Very good, the man muttered. Then he turned to me and said, how about you, Darren? Do you have a ticket? Yes, I said, reaching him to my pocket. Then I stopped dead in my tracks. He knew my name. I glanced at Steve and he was shaking in his boots. The tall man smiled. He had black teeth and some were missing and his tongue was a dirty shade of yellow. My name is Mr. Tall, he said. I own Cirque de Freak. How did you know my friend's name? Steve asked bravely. Mr. Tall laughed and bent down. So he was eyeball to eyeball with Steve. I know lots of things, he said softly. I know your names. I know where you live. I know you don't like your mummy and your daddy. He turned to face me and I took a step back. His breath sank to high heavens. I know you didn't tell your parents you were coming here. And I know how you won your ticket. How? I asked. 
My teeth were shaking so much, I wasn't sure if he heard me or not. If he did, he decided not to answer, because next he stood up and turned away from us. We must hurry, he said, beginning to walk. I thought he would take giant steps, but he didn't. He took short ones. The show is about to begin. Everyone else is present and seated. You are late, boys. You're lucky we didn't start without you. He turned a corner at the end of the corridor. He was only two or three steps in front of us. But when we turned the corner, he was sitting behind a long table covered with a black cloth, which reached down to the floor. He was wearing a tall red hat now and a pair of gloves. Tickets, please, he said, reached out, took them, opened his mouth and put the tickets in, then chewed them to pieces and swallowed. Very well, he said, you may now go in. We normally don't welcome children, but I can see you are two fine, courageous young men. We will make an exception. There were two blue curtains in front of us, drawn across the end of the hall. Steve and me looked at each other and gulped. Do we walk straight on? Steve asked. Of course, Mr. Saul said. Isn't there a lady with a torch? I asked. He laughed. If you want someone to hold your hand, he said, you should have brought the babysitter. That made me mad and I forgot for a moment how afraid I was. All right, I snapped, stepping forward, surprising Steve, if that's the way it is. I walked forward quickly and pushed past the curtains. I don't know what those curtains were made of, but they felt like spider's webs. I stopped once past. I was in a short corridor and another pair of curtains were draped across the walls, a few metres in front. There was a sound behind and then Steve was by my side. We could hear noises on the other side of the curtains. Do you think it's safe? I asked. I don't think, I think it's safer to go forward than backwards, he answered. I don't think Mr. Tall would like it if we turn back. How do you think he knew all that stuff about us? I asked. You must be able to read minds, Steve replied. Oh, I said, and thought about that for a few seconds. He nearly scared the life out of me, I admitted. Me too, Steve said. Then we stepped forward. It was a huge room. The chairs had been ripped out of the theatre long ago, but deck chairs had been set up in their place. We looked for spare seats. The entire theatre was packed but we were the only children there. I could feel people watching us and whispering. The only spaces were in the fourth row from the front. We had to step over lots of legs to get there and people were grumbling. When we sat down, we realised they were good seats because we were right in the middle and nobody at all was in front of us. We had a perfect view of the stage and could see everything. Do you think they sell popcorn? I asked. That's a freak show, Steve's naughty. Get real. They might sell snake eggs and lizard's eyes, but I'll bet anything you like they don't sell popcorn. The people in the theatre were a mixed bunch. Some were dressed stylishly, others in tracksuits. Some were as old as the hills, others just a few years older than Steve and me. Some chatted confidently to their companions and behaved as though at a football match. Others sat quietly in their chairs and gazed around nervously. What everyone shared was a look of excitement. I could see it in their eyes the same light that was shining in Steve's and mine. We all somehow knew that we were in for something special, the like of which we'd never seen before. Then a load of trumpets blew and the whole place went quiet. The trumpets blew for ages and ages, getting louder and louder, and every light went out until the theatre was pitch black. I began to get scared again, but it was too late to leave. All of a sudden, the trumpet stopped and there was silence. My ears were ringing and for a few seconds I felt dizzy. Then I recovered and sat up straight in my seat. Somewhere high up in the theatre, someone switched on a green light and the stage lit up. It looked eerie. For about a minute, nothing else happened. Then two men came on, pulling a cage. It was on wheels and covered with what looked like a huge bearskin rug. When they got to the middle of the stage, they stopped, dropped the ropes, ran back into the wings. For a few more seconds, silence. Then the trumpets blew again. Three sharp blasts. The rug came flying off the cage and the first freak was revealed. That was when the screaming began. Hello Year 6, my name is Mrs Maloney and I'm assistant head teacher here at St Cuthbert's and I'm going to read chapter 9 of Cirque the Freak. There was no need for the screaming. The freak was quite shocking but he was chained up inside the cage. I think the people who screamed did it for fun. The way people scream on a roller coaster, not because they were actually afraid. 
It was the wolf man. He was very ugly, hair all over his body. He only wore a piece of cloth around his middle, like Tarzan, so he could see his hairy legs and belly and back and arms. He had a long bushy beard which covered most of his face. His eyes were yellow and his teeth were red. He shook the bars of the cage and roared. It was pretty frightening. Lots more people screamed when he roared. I nearly screamed myself, except I didn't want to look like a baby. The wolfman went on shaking the bars and jumping about before calming down. When he was sitting on his backside, the way dogs do, Mr. Tall walked on and spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, he said. Even though his voice was low and croaky, everybody could hear what he was saying. Welcome to the Cirque de Freak. Home of the world's most remarkable human beings. We are an ancient circus, he went on. We have toured for 500 years, bringing the grotesque to generation after generation. Our lineup has changed many times, but never our aim, which is to astound and terrify you. We present acts both frightening and bizarre, acts you can find nowhere else in the world. Those who are easily scared. I'm sure there are people who came tonight thinking this was a joke. Maybe they thought our freaks could be people in masks or, or harmless misfits. This is not so. Every act you see tonight is real. Each performer unique and none are harmless. That was the end of his speech and he walked off stage. Two pretty women in shiny suits came on next and unlocked the door of the wolfman's cage. A few people looked scared, but nobody left. The wolfman was yapping and howling when he first came out of the cage until one of the ladies hypnotised him with her fingers. The other lady spoke to the crowd. You must be very quiet, he said in a foreign accent. The wolfman will not be able to hurt you as long as we control him. But a loud sound would wake him up, and then he would be dead. When they were ready, they stepped down from the stage and walked the hypnotised wolfman through the theatre. His hair was a dirty grey colour, and he walked with stoop, fingers hanging down around his knees. The lady stayed by his side and warned him to be quiet. She let you stroke him if you wanted, but you had to do it gently. Steve rubbed him when he went by, but I was afraid he might wake up and bite me, so I didn't. What did it feel like? I asked, quietly as I could. It was spiky, Steve replied, like a hedgehog. He lifted his fingers to his nose and sniffed. It smells strange too, like burning rubber. The wolfman and ladies were about halfway down the rows of seats when there was a big bang. I don't know what made the noise. But suddenly the wolfman began roaring and he shook the ladies away from him. People screamed and those nearest him leapt in their seats and ran. One woman wasn't quick enough and the wolfman leapt on her and dragged her to the ground. She was screaming fit to burst but nobody tried to help her. She stuck her hand up to push the man away. He got his teeth on her and bit it off. A couple of people fainted when they saw that and loads more began yelling and running. Then out of nowhere, Mr. Tall appeared behind the wolfman and wrapped his arms around him. The wolfman struggled for a few seconds, but Mr. Tall whispered something in his ear and he relaxed. While Mr. Tall led him back to the stage, the women in the suits calmed down the crowd and told them to return to their seats. While the crowd hesitated, the woman with the bitten off hand went on screaming. Blood was pumping out of the end of her wrist, covering the ground and other people. Steve and me were staring at her, our mouths wide open, wondering if she was going to die. Mr. Tarl returned from the stage, picked up the severed hand and gave a loud whistle. Two people in blue robes with hoods over their heads ran forward. They were sharp, not much bigger than me or Steve, but with thick arms and legs and lots of muscles. Mr. Tarl sat the woman up and whispered something in her ear. She stopped screaming. Mr. Tarl took hold of the wrist, then reached into his pocket and took out a small brown leather pouch. He opened it with his free hands and sprinkled the sparkly pink powder onto the bleeding wrist. 
Then he stuck the hand against it and nodded to the people in the blue suits. They produced a pair of needles and loads of strange strings and said, to the amazement of everybody in the theatre, they started to stitch the hand back onto the wrist. The people in blue robes stitched for five or six minutes. The woman didn't feel any pain, even though their needles were going in and out of her flesh all the way around the wrist. When they finished, they put their needles and unused thread away and returned to wherever they come from. Their hoods never slipped from their faces, so I couldn't tell if they were men or women. When they'd gone, Mr. Tall let go of the woman's hand and stepped back. Move your fingers, he said. The woman stared at him. Blankly. Move your fingers, he said again. This time she gave them a wiggle. They moved. Everybody gasped. The woman stared at the fingers as though she didn't believe they were real. She gave them another wiggle, then she stood and lifted the hand above her head. She shook it as hard as she could, and it was good as new. You could see stitches, but there was no more blood, and the fingers seemed to be working fine. You will be okay. Told her. The stitches will fall out after a couple of days. It will be fine after that. Maybe that's not good enough, someone shouted, and a big red faced man stepped forward. I'm her husband, he said, and I say she would, we should go to a doctor and then the police. You can't let a wild animal like that out into a crowd. What if he'd bitten her head off? Then she would be dead, the tall said calmly. Listen, Buster, the husband began, but Mr. Tall interrupted. Tell me, sir, Mr. Tall said. Where were you when the wolfman was attacking me? The man asked. Yes, Mr. Tall said. You are her husband. You were sitting beside her when the beast escaped. Why did you not sleep to her rescue? Well, I, uh, there was no time. I, well, I couldn't. I, I wasn't. He said the husband couldn't win, that there was only one true answer. He had been running away, looking after himself. Listen to me, Mr. Tall said. I gave fair warning. I said this show could be dangerous. This is not a nice, safe circus where nothing goes wrong. Mistakes can and do happen. And sometimes people end up a lot worse off than your wife. That's why this show is banned. That's why we must play in old theatres in the middle of the night. Most of the time, things go smoothly and nobody gets hurt. You cannot guarantee your safety. Mr. Tall turned around in a circle and seemed to look everybody in the eye while turning. We cannot guarantee anybody's safety. Another accident like this is unlikely, but it could happen. Once again, I say, if you are afraid, leave. Leave now before it is too late. Few people did leave, but most stayed to see the rest of the show, even the woman who nearly lost her hand. Do you want to go? I asked Steve, half hoping to say yes. I was excited, but scared as well. Are you crazy? He said. This is great. You don't want to go, do you? No way. I lied, slapped on a shaky little smile. If only I hadn't been so scared of looking like Howard. I could have left and everything would be fine. But no, I had to act like a big man and sit it out to the end. If you only knew how many times I've wished since then that I'd fled with all the speed in my body and never My name is Mr Sunderland and I'm going to read to you chapter 10. As soon as Mr Tall had left the stage and we'd settled back into our seats, the second freak, Alexander Ribbs, came on. He was more of a comedy act than a scary one, which was just what we needed to calm us down after the terrifying start. I happened to look over my shoulder while he was on and noticed two of the blue hooded people down on their knees, cleaning blood from the floor. Alexander Ribbs was the skinniest man I've ever seen. He looked like a skeleton. There seemed to be no flesh on him. He would have been frightening except he had a wide, friendly smile. Funny music played and he danced around the stage. He was dressed in ballet clothes and looked so ridiculous that soon everybody was laughing. After a while, he stopped dancing and began stretching. He said he was a cartoonist, somebody with bones like rubber, 
who can bend every which way. Firstly, he tilted his head back so far, it looked like it had been, it looked like it'd been cut off. He turned round so he could see his upside down face, then went on leaning backwards until his head was touching the floor. Then he put his hands around the back of his legs and pulled his head through until it was sticking up in front of him. It looked like he was growing out of his stomach. He got a huge round of clapping for that, after which he straightened up and began twisting his body around like a curly-whirly straw. He kept twisting and twisting five times around until his bones began to crack from the strain. He stood like that for a minute, then began to unwind really, really fast. Next, he got two drumsticks with furry ends. He took the first drumstick and hit one of his bony ribs with it. He opened his mouth and a musical note sprang out. It sounded like the noise pianos make. Then he closed his mouth and struck a rib on the other side of his body. This time it was a louder, higher note. After a few more practice goes, he kept his mouth open and began playing songs. He played London Bridges Falling Down, some songs by the Beatles and the theme tune from a few well-known TV shows. The skinny man left the stage to shout for more, but none of the freaks ever came back to an encore. After Alexander Ribbs came, Ram was two bellies, and he was as fat as Alexander was thin. He was enormous. The floorboards creaked as he walked out onto the stage. He walked close to the edge and kept pretending he was about to topple forward. I could see people in front rows getting worried, and some jumped back out of the way when he got close. I don't blame them. He would have squashed them flat as a pancake if he fell. He stopped in the middle of the stage. Hello, he said. He had a nice voice, low and squeaky. My name is Ramus Two Bellies, and I really have two bellies. I was born with them, the same way certain animals are. The doctors were stunned and said I was a freak, and that's why I joined this show, and I'm here tonight. The lady who had hypnotised the wolfman came out with two trolleys full of food, cakes, chips, hamburgers, packets of sweets, and heads of cabbage. There was stuff there that I hadn't ever seen before, never mind tasted. Yum yum, Rama said. He pointed to a huge clock being lowered by the ropes from above. It stopped about three metres above his head. How long do you think it will take me to eat all this? He asked, pointing to the food. There will be a prize for the person who guessed closest. An hour, someone yelled. 45 minutes, someone else roared. Two hours, 10 minutes and 33 seconds, another person shouted. Soon everybody was calling out. I said an hour and three minutes. Steve said 29 minutes. The lowest guess was 17 minutes. When we were finished guessing, the clock started to tick and Rama started to eat. He ate like the wind. His arm moved so fast you could hardly see them. His mouth didn't seem to close at all. He shoveled food in, swallowed and moved on. Everybody was amazed. I felt sick as I watched. Some people were actually were sick. Finally, Rama scoffed the last bun and the clock above his head stopping ticking. Four minutes and 56 seconds. He'd eaten all that food in less than five minutes. I could hardly believe it. It didn't seem possible, even for a man with two bellies. That was nice, Rama said, but I could have done with more dessert. While we clapped and laughed, the ladies in shiny suits rolled the trolleys away and brought on a new one packed with the glass statues and forks and spoons and bits of metal junk. Before I begin, Rama said, I must warn you not to try this at home. I can eat things which you choke and kill normal people. Do not try to copy me. If you do, you may die. He began eating. He started with a couple of nuts and bolts, which he sucked down without blinking. After a few handfuls, he gave his big round belly a shake and we could hear all the noise of the metal inside. His belly heaved and he spat the nuts and bolts back out. If there'd only been one or two, I might have thought he was keeping them under his tongue or at the sides of his cheeks. Not even Rama's two bellies mouth was big enough to hold that load. Next, he ate the glass statues. He crunched and the glass up into small pieces before swallowing it with a drink of water. Then he ate the spoons and forks. He twisted them up into circles with his hands, popped them into his mouth and let them slide down. He said his teeth weren't strong enough to tear through metal 
After that, he saw the long metal chain and paused to catch his breath. His belly began rumbling and shaking. I didn't know what was going on until he gave a heave and I saw the top of the chain come out of his mouth. As the chain came out, I saw that the spoons and forks were wrapped around it. He had managed to poke the chain through the hoops inside his belly. It was unbelievable. When Ramos left the stage, I thought nobody could top such an act. I was wrong.